And you're listening to the Dr. Chris Radio Horror Program on 91.3 FM, WCW in Worcester, Massachusetts. And if you're not listening to us on WCW 91.3, then please, uh, hopefully you're listening to us on our YouTube channel or VidMe channel. Check out VidMe. It's a lot less conservative than YouTube, and they're not as uptight, and they're a lot more like freedom-wise, I can say fuck and not sm- sm- censor it out. So there you go. And on the show with us now is a woman of many words who hasn't been on the show in almost eight years. We completely aged her when we mentioned that to her too she is a writer producer director executive producer but she's not a transporter yet we're gonna be she's gonna become a transporter soon for her own actors and her own films we have alexia anastasio on the show with us thank you for coming back on the show with us alexia thank you chris so much i'm honored to be on the show again what are you working on currently because it's been eight years since you were on the show but a lot of times i keep getting emails that you're running film classes and stuff and teaching <laughs> the young whippersnappers of los angeles california or wherever it is that you live yeah. <laughs> the art of filmmaking i love teaching because uh it, first of all it's emotionally fulfilling for me like to see to use my knowledge that I I had to just learn out of the need of like, oh, I want to continue making films uh, to others and then seeing them be my success stories and go out there and crowdfund for their own films and doing some teaching um, in Los Angeles and online. Uh, so people can kind of chime in through my website and we do little live classes through the phone and through the internet. Mm-hmm. these days uh, but so that's what I've been doing, doing teaching yeah and then also uh, the, I'm working on a couple of projects one is Ginger Girls it's a documentary about women with natural red hair it's a documentary it's a photo series and an art show and I, I just had to show some of my photographs in an art show my birthday actually at Andy Dick's gallery in Hollywood so that was an honor and privilege to be like yeah i get to show my work like in a physical form you know on the wall in a place you know it's full of plastic uh, <laughs> but yeah so that was it was it was fun my parents came and even bill plimpton the subject of my most notable documentary adventures and plumptoons came because he was in town and and so so i've been working on that project and then i'm i just finished up a script called the fantastic santa monica which i'm going to be filming this year so, yeah, diving into my writing self at the moment. When you say Andy Dick's gallery, you mean like Andy Dick, the, the actor? Yes. He has an art gallery? Yeah. That's, I would never have thought that. He's, mm-hmm. he doesn't, his his performances and the things that he, he's been in has never struck me as he's an artist. He's a, yeah, he's a photographer and art collector. Um, and then he has a couple of kids and one his kids um, Meg Dick who's also very funny and an actress herself has been producing these theater uh, 24 hour like theater shows and so I got to write for one of the shows when a, a little play skit or sketch or whatever you call it where you got the theme 24 hours you're supposed to get the theme 24 hours in advance and then you know they they the actors are given to it you know, about eight hours in advance, they rehearse, they memorize the lines, and then they perform it, Then you know, the next night. I was given it with, like, two hours notice. And they're like, can you, we, you know, somebody bailed out, can you write a, a scene? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm glad I wasn't given too much time. Because uh, I just, like, went out of instinct, and it, it just kind of wrote itself, the theme. And then I got to see it performed, which was pretty cool. Now, we were making jokes offline that you've done every form of job in making a movie because you have been doing this um, before, I think, before I started Radio of Horror, which was um, going... Uh, Radio of Horror currently, by the way, is this is 2017, and we started Radio of Horror October 15th, 2007. Well, I started... Um, I mean, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. It was about 98, 99. So I started volunteering around there then 2000 on other people's independent films and then creating my own with friends and then also taking digital film classes at college at SUNY Purchase in New York and so I yeah I started I I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a filmmaker and before that I I thought I just wanted to be an actor Um, and now I'm really focusing on the directing producing writing part because I just get more out of it 
um, even though acting is still fun for me, but I just get more of the, like the artistic side of, of filmmaking and the collaboration. Yeah, I've done one of one of my first films that I worked on. Ex, it was called Exist. I didn't even get a real credit. I did so many things on that set that they're like a little bit of everything. And I'm like, I want a real credit title. Like, is that, you know, too hard? (laughs) And I was pretty upset, but I did do a lot of different things, including like getting food donated to the set and then provide a minivan for, to bring everybody around. And, and we slept on a, you know, we basically squatted in a house in South um, Philadelphia for a whole summer, and I learned a lot about independent filmmaking on that on that film set. By house squatting, you learned a lot about independent filmmaking. Yes, yeah, like, <laughs> we were squat. Well, I mean, it was, <laughs> you hear that, folks? Actors, From a teacher, house squat. House, learn how to film. All the crew, yeah, all the crew were, were were on a floor, and there was like no hot water. You know, because they were like, he, he, he was li- leaving the next month. But we're like, okay, well, we have a place for everybody to live and stay for the month. Let's make a movie. <laughs> we live in a very, it, it seems like we're reverting back into the dark ages um, without getting into any reasons why. You can make your own speculations about what it is I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. When you started coming into the scene in the late 90s, there were, other than like Sofia Coppola, there was, like, no such thing as, like, a female director or female producer unless you work for, like, James Cameron and you happen to be, you know, Catherine, Bi- you know, married to him like Catherine Bigelow was. God, I'm, I'm, I'm a horror host and I'm, the name is escaping right right, right now, but the uh, the woman you see in, like, all of the Nightmare on Elm Street documentaries that she worked very closely with, Wes Craven, that woman, yep. um, Gail, is that her name? Gail? She's, like, the producer, I think, now on, like, The Walking Dead. Yeah, you know, for every one of those, there was, like, a hundred a thousand other male producers and act and, and, and stuff like that. What made you think that you were going to be able to break into this extremely male dominated world outside of being an actress? Well, I, I think one thing being in New York versus Hollywood, I didn't see that many people working in the, in the industry. And, and then when I went to film festivals, I like, I went to a film festival at the pioneer theater. It was like a panel and it was about women filmmaking. And so one of my early mentors was uh, a female. And she was part of a secret, um, like, women, um, supporting women type of group. And they actually handed out stickers with the Gorilla Girls about the statistics in Hollywood of the women, you know, who work in Hollywood. And, and But it was such a supportive group that I'm like, oh, well, these guys are kind of helping each other. Then, you know, I don't have anything, you know to worry about. I can just do it. And, and also my mom being an entrepreneur, she does real estate. Uh, I saw her being a boss, you know, I'm like, Oh, well in my, you know, surroundings in my you know family structure, my mom wears the pants. And so I'm like, she gets to make her own hours, even though she works all the time, she decides what she wants and what she does. And so I had a very strong role model of my mom growing up of like, okay, well, if I, this is what I want to do. I'm going to have to work my butt off to make it happen. And I'm going to do it outside any sort of system. I'm going to do it on my own terms. All a couple of those combined helped me. What was the first project that you grasped onto to really make your own? I did a, a little short film with my friend in, in college called the dryer film. It was based on me being afraid of like living in a co-ed dorm basically <laughs> uh in college and i like went in and also like inspired by a lot of like the experimental films i'd been watching or I, so i went into a dryer and it, i think i have it up on youtube that was kind of like the first foray and and then you know i was just making a lot of documentaries i'd ask a lot of my friends on on their experience in college so i had a little short film on that called super no friendo and I was just watching them like have sex and and do drugs and and I was just the voyeur um, and the camera gave me an excuse to ask questions and be like you know what's going on here you know what's this all about you didn't film them doing this did you no I just asked them questions oh okay while they were having sex and doing drugs 
No, just like asking about. How does this position feel to you? Does it does it you feel like you're in control because you're on top? No. <laughs> okay. I was too naive. I'm like, wait a minute, where is she going with this? Because this sounds like an amazing documentary that that's not <laughs> pornographic, but it's like inside the mind of somebody while they're in the middle of intercourse. Yeah. No, no, no. It wasn't. It wasn't that graphic at all. It was. It was... I was very naive. No, um, I just figured maybe you'd make it very PG and like blurry everything out. You know what I mean? With like kittens. Uh, or something. <laughs> no, I wasn't that smart. No. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. You could have had like a marketing like, like ge- you could have been like a marketing genius and had like gold on your hands right there. I could have, you know, but I'm still working on that. We're still working on that. But yeah, like yeah, so like a lot of my films are like one of them when I did like my senior year is called relationship drama and yeah, it just gave me an excuse to be like, ask questions you know even when i'd be nervous to just ask them in real life i'd be like oh well i have this camera and i'm holding on to like so i have more authority to ask them the questions and and then you know even play like my writing is very cathartic of like what i'm going through and and my relationships and kind of process it and then put it in the writing relationships professionally or relationships personally usually personally uh, but I mean, really both, but usually personally. You, you seem to be tied to the. Uh, at one point, you were seem to be tied to the horror industry more than anything else. Do you feel like you're doing things breaking out of that? Yeah, been working with a number of people, um, especially you know, volunteering for Trauma and learning a lot about the convention circuit, and then editing the documentary on Vampira. Um, which really helped me give me confidence to do my own stuff. So when I got to edit that documentary and, and be on panels and take my own um, art films, re- really, um, my short films, were, which were really art films, they weren't hard films at all, um, to the con- convention, the heart, and especially the horror convention and conventions and pop culture conventions, you know, people seem to embrace it because horror fans love art. So yeah, they don't just want to be spoon fed tits and ass and bloody gory violence anymore. You know no. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there so. is, there is still like, there's still people that kind of want that, but honestly we really have evolved and grown up. And for every time that we see bad horror movie, it's mainly because they were made by people who don't get the horror genre or there's too much studio interference, like, you know, uh, The Bye Bye Man came out, and that sucked. But, like, Get Out was, like, really well done, you know what I mean? Or, speaking of, like, direct-to-video stuff, uh, look at, like, Eli Ross' Clown. I thought that was a very smartly done movie, taking the story of, like, how, you know, where does the clown come from? Oh, the clown was a demon, and we, you know... <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. But, but yeah, like my, my, like, I brought my short films to the to the circuit and then like what people would like one and they'd want to buy the next one and then I you know did Adventures in Plumptoons about Bill Plimpton that was about a guy who's a full-time artist and I learned about that and then even the, like the next one was like Little Fishes which was an art film you know so it, and that yet it was a very similar audience of like all these people who tend to like my films like the next one, even though they were very different topics. Um, so, which just says like, you know, people are smart, <laughs> you know, and, and they like art and they like introspection and they like existentialism and, and, you know, so giving just the audience credit for, you know, what they like. By the way, this is going to air, not this week, this is going to air next week. So, okay. So just in case uh, there's something you forget, like you want to add or something you want, like cut out or whatever, that's that's fine. You can let me know. But then, you know, you um, you mentioned trauma films and you've also worked with like Herschel Gordon Lewis on Seven Deadly Sins. I was lucky to work with him before he passed away. Uh, yeah. So Seven Deadly Sins is a comedy. It's a mockumentary. And some people think like, oh, he was a detective. I'm like, no, it's a joke. You know, I'm not really missing um, um, but yeah, I love, I love Christopher Guest's films and I love improv. I've been part of an improv troupe called Playback Theater where we perform the audience's stories. And, and, and in 2009 is when I shot that and, you know, we, we made that film and I was in Los Angeles and I was just like, Hey, I'm doing actually adventures in some tunes. I'm like, we're like, there's all these actors around, all my friends. They're like, let's just make something. Let's just do something. And yeah, they're shot on a very low budget. 
and it was it was a great um, learning of like, hey, you don't need a gazillion dollars to make a feature, and, and you don't need a gazillion dollars to make a good feature. You can just do it and have fun, and, and I think that's why it's it's so fun and playful. Um, between yeah. now, between now and the last time you came on the show, you were in something called uh, Supernatural's Weird Supernatural's <laughs> Weird, Creepy, and Random. Did you put the Z on the end of it to dis- differentiate it from the Supernatural TV series? I believe yes. The producers, uh, directors uh, decided that. <laughs> yes. Again, but, staying uh, in the horror genre as you uh, you you seem to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that that film is it's that's like a horror sci-fi camp. That's really a campy film, you know. And so people, if they get like Rocky Horror Picture Show, and the like, those are the people who get that movie. And um, and that was actually shot at um, a property that I was a property manager for for almost a year. It, and it's it was just this magical place. And then we just had we were able to have fun on on the property and film this in this and make it a scary a scary place what's really funny is that you get to work with in your upcoming ginger documentary it's a documentary right yes yes uh with uh one of my favorite actresses uh one of the most beautiful women alive angie everhart who i i didn't realize i've seen like a ton of her earlier stuff uh, like at Last Action Hero, and she's she plays the vampire queen Lilith in uh, Bordello of Blood, uh, w- where uh, she has some of the most ridiculous, off the wall, overly sexualized lines and dialogue and mannerism in that movie. Um, and I just completely fell in love with her, as most boys who were 15 years old did at the time when that movie came out. <laughs> yeah, it, Angie's. That's the one great thing about being in Los Angeles is that it is easier to meet. Um, celebrities and um, people who've been in the spotlight and Angie was su- super you know available she said yes like to me right away and then we set up a date and we, we did our shoot and she's just she's so smart and so fun and she's just like she actually um, has a um, maybe boy that she brought to set and, and you know it was just like it was so cute yeah it's just like this is so easy like she was just like easy to work with and like I'm like wow I wish everybody was you know just super on top of it like she was we will so. uh, we will have to um, I never thought about reaching out to her but uh, the thing is the great thing is about um, living in 2017 social media has made it very accessible to reach out to you know different celebrities to contact them yeah. for projects things like that without being like gotta wait to hear back from the agent the agent doesn't really feel, think that it's the best interest of the client and then when the client does eventually does find out they're like I would have done that yeah you know and it's yeah. like my well, agent's yeah, not my mommy what... my agent is 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 acts like my my uh my um what's the word i'm looking for bed mother no um what's the name of the woman who used to run like the all girl house or whatever and she had to make sure all the girls were in by a certain time oh yeah like kind of like mother superior sort of thing. yeah you know what i mean it was like it was always a big thing back in like the 40s and 50s and stuff like that when women would like live together in like an apartment before there was like you know, before whoever came up with the idea of being like, men and women can live in the same building, aren't dating <laughs> each other, you know, they can be roommates and they can be living in different apartments. It's, but, you know, what's upon a time? I still think it's dangerous. I think it's still think it's dangerous. You still think <laughs> it's dangerous for men and <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I've, I've heard that a lot before because it was like, uh, who was it that I, I actually, I ratted someone's agent out to them and they were like, I don't have that agent anymore afterwards. Yeah. It was Doug yeah, Jones. Well, that's what's so great about conventions. Like I met Angie actually at a convention. So, um, yeah, conventions are great for that. Uh, it was Doug Jones. Oh, Doug Jones is great. And it was at Rock and Shock too that I said to him, uh, uh I, your your agent said you wouldn't ever be interested in doing an interview and he was like what he like gets down into yeah. this like his spine bends in such a way because he's so tall yeah. to like my eye level or whatever and he takes he's my hand so, in his hand and I, he's like yeah. I would never say that to somebody why would my agent say that <laughs> he's Doug is super nice I saw him in an improv show like at Second City like he does anything. He's ha- he has fun. And then he gave me his, like, he, like, reaches underneath the table into this bag and pulls out, like, two business cards and gives me this. Here's my personal number. Give me a call at yeah. home. I will take your call. And I was like, oh! Yeah. <laughs> He's like, can yeah. you keep a secret? I was like, sure. Here's my personal business number. My personal number. I'm like, oh! 
<laughs> having like a fanboy moment of my dreams. What was funny is actually he came on uh, in 2010, the first year that you came on. He uh, came on to promote uh, the Legion. He was in Legion where he plays the demented ice cream man. <laughs> <laughs> So this is like your big prod, your your big documentary that's going to kind of take over your life for a while. I mean, when you're putting together a documentary uh, like this, is it is the biggest task in trying to like reach out to all the different people? Are you having like so far I only see on IMDb like three people? So are you yeah, putting like I, all I sorts to, of gingers? I, I've interviewed actually like probably over a hundred. People. Wow. I've photographed over 250 people. But yeah, I've been working on it for a number of years now. And so this is the year I'm like kind of finalizing um, the project. And But yeah, I have to add people as we cut the, the film together. So that's that's what, yeah, we're in the, the end of production. Like we're going to post production soon. Someone drive out on a motorcycle? Yes. Uh, has there been anything offered you that you turned down that you wish you hadn't? I, I'm pretty intuitive. Things that I don't, just not interested uh, or interested, yeah, or are interesting to me, and I get clearer and clearer like as time goes by. Convention. You said you haven't hit the convention circuit in a couple of years. Is um, you looking to return to it with uh, with something? Um, I mean, uh, this ginger uh, thing. Yeah. I might. I'm assuming he's gonna have like some. Uh, actresses and act actresses excuse me in it from horror and sci-fi that you can go to those type of conventions with because they're spotlighting you know those type of genre actresses yeah now it's become easier i think to reach fans through live streaming so i've kind of become obsessed semi-obsessed with live streaming Mm -hmm. also like with the conventions you know it actually costs money to, to do, you know, you, you, you usually, sometimes you're a guest, but sometimes you have to buy a booth. And so, you know, sometimes it was like a break even scenario where like I bought a booth and you make money, it would, you know, pay for the hotel and driving to the conventions and things like that. Now with like live streaming, it's, it's not as expensive. Like I've spent thousands of dollars going to conventions and it's a lot of fun. But then after I did Adventures in Platoons, I was festivals were paying me money to screen my movie and flying me there i'm like oh well this is a lot cheaper when other people pay you money than when you pay money to to put together everything um and then now with live streaming you can reach that same audience that you've met online and then more people so it's become easier uh that way and it's not like one thing goes away with the other it's just like up I think now it's I'm focusing on live streaming and doing videos, and then I'll probably go back out into the convention maybe in a couple of years. But especially this year, I'll be focusing on production. What about like Patreon? Ever thought about doing that? Yes, I have many times. And but the thing with Patreon, you do need to have a little bit of you have to have time set out and planned out to do it. Um, I probably will start a Patreon at some point um, soon. Yeah, Kickstarter is still my my favorite platform. With your, um, but you you can also you know you you have your your classes as well, which um, you can uh, you can plug as well too if you have like a specific website people can go to to sign up for them. And yeah, uh, I'm assuming that that money my, really helps too. My, yeah, people can go to my website, which is just alexianastasio.com, and they can find out about my classes, um, or they can contact me, they can see, you know, links to my work, you know, all that fun jazz. What type of advice would you have for, in 2017, with people graduating from either college or high school, and they want to do what you want to do? And let me give you an example. My co-host for Supernatural Creatures and Lore, uh, which is funny enough uh like your supernaturals uh weird creepy and random uh it's a podcast dedicated to the television series supernatural where we talk about the monsters mythology lore and history of the monster of the week on that show mm-hmm. and uh, my co-host cat is 17 years old she'll be 18 i think in about a, two weeks and she's graduating oh. from high school and she wants to be a filmmaker she doesn't want to be an actress she wants to be a filmmaker and she's like she she knows how to edit i know that's, that's the great. one thing i can least vouch for her for is that she knows how to edit because her editing skills on her YouTube videos I think are fantastic are 
up there as good with like other people who are professional YouTubers. And I'm using quotations because I don't even know if that's the right word. A professional <laughs> YouTuber. Uh, yeah. Anyway, long story short, she is, uh, that's what she wants to do. She wants to be, become a female director. You know, we've joked that I will write, you know, when she graduates from college, I will have the first script ready for her and we will like make a movie together based on like the most fucking crazy thing that we could possibly come up with. <laughs> which I said to her, in two weeks I will talk to you about the script because you're not 18 yet and there's a lot of sex, drug, and nudity in my script. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, fine, deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, so advice, uh, I've I had a lot of interns and, and I love mentoring young filmmakers. Um, so the advice would be, first of all, just do it. Don't be afraid of, of doing a feature versus a short, you know, cause a lot of, I think a lot of teachers tell people to like, especially their students to like think small, like just do a short film and then get it out there. You know, it's, it might take a little more work to do a feature, but it's not much more money. Um, so when, when you have a feature, you just you just get a, a huge sense of confidence from from making a feature film. Do not be afraid of doing a feature. And then second of all, uh, start an email list, and you can do that for free on a, a website called like Mailchimp, and collect the the people that you who've watched you grow up. You know, like your family, your friends, people who. You know, tell the, your people on YouTube and Facebook all to sign up for your email list. So when you do perhaps possibly maybe a crowdfunding campaign and you don't need to raise that much money, that's say even two or three thousand dollars, you know, to do your first even feature film, you, you have that base and it's not as hard to make it. Happen. What about uh, working? Hmm, let me start over. Yeah. Let me pause for a second and then I'll start over. What about a suggestion someone else brought up um, in another episode who was also a filmmaker trying to uh, give it, give advice that uh, work on a bunch of other people's like miniature products, pro- products, projects, uh, films, uh, you know, the free stuff, the stuff that you're finding on NewEnglandFilm.com, which is a very reputable, uh, very, very reputable website uh, for independent filmmakers to find uh, cheap and affordable uh, crew, cast and crew for their movies. I posted on there a bunch of times and had had pretty decent success and uh that will at least build up your you know your imdb or your resume or at least give you a bunch of contacts that you can use as references to work on someone else's project that might actually pay you something yeah that i i worked on i volunteered for a lot of films and i crewed on a lot of films um did it help me yeah it did help me but i also you know like if especially edit if editing is her thing you know like i would try to tell her to get some editing gigs if that's for free or you know pay what you wish or for a low amount because you'll you learn a lot and that's editing is something that's super needed um in the market and you can do that from pretty much anywhere i even hire an editor in connecticut so i'm here in los angeles for the documentary that i'm you know you know i'm working on so yeah, I. But it, it's not like the the be all of end all is, is is not just working on other people's films. It's, it's doing your own films. The, that's where you gotta learn. You, you gotta learn by doing having your own mistakes. You know, like you can be like, oh yeah, that person did that, and that person treated that person horribly. I'm not gonna do that. You gotta just do it to to learn. Um, so I, w- I would say just jump in. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much again for coming back on the show. Um, been been a while, but hopefully we'll see you out here at uh, you know one of the uh, conventions uh, here in Massachusetts again. Maybe, excuse me, maybe Rock and Shock. Yeah, maybe. You got to tell them to invite me this time. We'll, uh, <laughs> I, I will, I will, I will pass it on to uh, Kevin and Gina. Okay, cool. Um, you were with like some studio last time you were out here, wasn't it? Weren't you like with the uh, promoting like uh, trauma or something? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I yeah I volunteered for for trauma um, back in the day. It was a long time ago. Gotcha. Well, <laughs> thank you again so much for coming out, uh, coming on the show with us again. We really do appreciate it. And uh, just plug out your social media for people to reach out to you if you wish. Yeah, you can go to my website alexianastasio.com. That's a l e x i a a n a s t a s i o dot com or at alexianastasio on all other social media platforms. Cool. 